Hello, I'm Daniel Spiewak. Uh, they, they asked me to give an introduction uh, to myself, but I, you know, I, I always feel that that's, that's a little bit awkward. I, I've been around the Scholar community for uh, a really long time. Uh, I, I'm sure I know a lot of you in the audience, um, you know, personally or, or in passing, and I'm looking forward to meeting, uh, you know, many more of you in, in the coming months and years. Um, Scala 3. <laughs> Scala 3 is, is really exciting. Uh, I think, you know, I, I've certainly been looking forward to this for a very, very long time. Um, you know, I think back to uh, when I first heard about Scala 3, I, I think, I don't know, I guess it would probably be about six years ago now, uh, five, six years ago. Um, it was Dottie then. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, the, my first exposure to the project was actually in the context of formal systems. I've always had a, a, an interest in the mathematical analysis of languages and, and you know, sort of formalizing languages so that we can prove various properties about them. And, uh, you know, I, I heard about Dottie within the context of the latest effort to actually do that. Um, and, and I say latest because, uh, it, you know, it, it, there is a long tradition uh, or there had been a long tradition of, of trying to do this with the scholar language, like trying to formalize the language, as you would expect from a language that comes from an academic tradition like Scala. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of really good reasons to try to formalize a language. Uh, you know, the basic idea is that building languages is very hard. Building compilers is, is even harder, really. And, uh, you know, and, and it's a particularly delicate space because you're simultaneously trying to construct one of the most complex pieces of software ever written, um, but simultaneously trying to do it with a very high degree of correctness because, you know, this piece of software, this compiler, is the foundational layer for, you hope, an entire ecosystem. So it's, it's a very, very, very difficult thing to do and a very difficult thing to do well. And formalisms and formal systems have a tendency to give us the ability to do this better. They have a tendency to give us higher confidence in the fact that we can do this correctly. And, and that is very, very profound. The, um, you know, I, I've written a number of compilers um, over the years, and, and the common thread in all of them is that if you can derive out a very simple core calculus, you know, something with a, a small set of axioms that you can reason about, and you can understand what those axioms mean, then you avoid problems like testability of your language. Like it's still hard to test, but at least you can be confident that you've tested everything. You avoid, you know, random things that come up where, you know, some, you know, somehow two language features are interacting in like a way that you just didn't anticipate. Um, so formalizing a language can be a really good way to get yourself out of those sorts of, of quagmires uh, before they even happen. And so it's, it's a really great thing to do even apart from the academic interest, right? Like being able to prove things about a language, being able to talk about the things about the language that are novel, um, you know, being able to research those things in a very confined and, and tractable environment. That's all very, 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 very attractive academically. And thus ultimately, you know, hopefully also attractive industrially as those features begin to find their way into the mainstream. So, uh, so formalism is good, right? So formal foundations are really good. And, and this was not news, not to me, not to anyone. And people had been trying to do it on Scala for years. Um, you know, I, I have no idea when the first effort was to do this on Scala, probably even predating Scala 2. Um, you know, but, but various members of, of, you know, the LAMP lab had, had, had sort of attempted this. You know, Martin had attempted this. And, and really, there had been varying successes, like uh, Adrian Moore's, uh, you know, thesis about higher kind of types in, in Scala 2.7 comes to mind as, as a, a good success in the process of formalizing and proving things about Scala's type system. But really, you know, a, a complete formalism of the whole language had been elusive. And, and so, you know, I, when I first heard about Dottie, I was very glad to see that the torch was being passed forward. Um, but I was also, you know, perhaps understandably quite skeptical. You know, when you see people assail the mountain over and over again, and, and they all come back down again, it's, it's, you, you start to expect that no one's going to make it to the top. Um, well, Nada Amin proved me wrong. And um, her work, you know, the work of Martin and, you know, everybody uh, surrounding that effort deserves so much credit uh, and, and, you know, I, I think so much ongoing credit 
for what is about to happen to the Scala ecosystem and the new era of Scala that is being ushered in uh, by the release of Scala 3 and, and by these latest things. You know, the, the, the formalism that they have provided in the form of the dot calculus really gives us a new foundation on which to reimagine the Scala language, which is exactly what the team has done. And that new foundation gives us the ability to ask questions about the language that we could have never asked before because we didn't have that kind of rigor, that type of grounding that a formal system gives us. Uh, so a great example of this is type projection, right? Type projection is, is sort of when you, uh, you know, take a type and you, you project onto it to get, you know, sort of a, a type that's calculated from that type. Um, this is done, you know, either with the hash operator or the dot operator, depending on context in Scala, usually the hash operator. And uh, type projection is very powerful. It's, it's been around for a very, very long time. It's one of the oldest mechanisms for type level computation in the Scala language. Uh, I can remember uh, back in Scala 2.7, the uh, very first proof that Scala's type system was Turing complete was an encoding of the SKI calculus uh, in the type system using type projection. Uh, Martin was horrified, um, as, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a magnificent work. Like, it was a wonderful bit of mathematics. And, uh, you know, it really proved just how powerful type projection could be. Um, so, you know, fast forward, you know, 10 years now since, since that day and that blog post, and, you know, we, we've kind of moved away from type projection as a primary mechanism for type level computation. Frameworks like Shapeless, for example, um, mostly use implicits and, and sort of implicit search as a mechanism for computation, but it's always been still there. And, and there've still been a few use cases where type projection was just the easiest way to get something done. So I, I've certainly built plenty of, of shall we say, abusive uh, software um, you know, taking advantage of this feature over the years to do, you know, varyingly creative things with the Scala language. Um, and uh, what's interesting uh, is with the dot calculus and that new formalism that we were able to base things on and that the Scala 3 language is based upon, um, it was discovered that the, you know, type projection that we all know and love is unsound. Um, or rather, at least unsound in the very general form that it exists in Scala 2. Um, in, in particular, the existence of null really messes everything up, and, and you can't really have totally unconstrained type projection without running into the possibility that you may be projecting on the null type, and, and that's just not valid. You can't really define any semantics for that. So um, this was a really interesting discovery, right? And these are the types of things that you discover when you build a solid foundation for your language, when you build a firm formalism to use to reason about your language, because you can ask these types of very precise questions and get a very precise answer from your formalism in a way that it's quite hard to do if the only definition for your language is, you know, the whole compiler. Um, so as Scala you know, as the Scala 3 project matured, as the Dottie project matured, these sorts of things were discovered and smoothed over and like dot calculus was refined. And it was truly a remarkable and exciting thing to watch as, as this has sort of come together. And, and the EPFL team has done an absolutely amazing job um, pressing through this because, I, you know, I, I think it's important for everybody to understand what has happened here. The Scala 3 compiler is truly a reimagining of all of Scala on, the, on a new foundation, a stronger foundation, you know, with a brand new compiler, a brand new type system, really, and yet it somehow manages to come back to the same place that it always was, with very, very, very few exceptions. And this brings me to one of my earliest fears about Scala 3, like one of the very first things that I was worried about when I heard about the Scala 3 project, which is how do you migrate existing code bases that were written against Scala 2 to Scala 3? And, and how do you make that even possible to an industry which has grown so fast? Like, you have to realize that in the early days of Scala, you know, the last time that there was a major version update between Scala 1 and Scala 2, the only users of Scala were, were Martin and uh, Martin's friends and Martin's students and Martin's colleagues. And that was it. <laughs> Like, you know, you really, you, you, the, the ecosystem now is night and day compared to what it was the last time we went through a major shift like this. 
And, and Scala 1 to Scala 2 was major. Like, Scala 1 is almost unrecognizable today. But by the same token, there, there, you know, there wasn't really that many people around to be disrupted by that change. Compare that to today, when by some counts you have a million, a million and a half uh, users of Scala. You know, it's been deployed in production by almost every major company on Earth. Um, you have you know, numerous household name products that are built on top of Scala. And not only built on top of Scala, but built on top of major elements of the Scala ecosystem, like Akka and Play and you know, the type level stack and you know, all these sorts of things. We're seeing the adoption in such a vast, vast number of cases. Um, and, and so many people have staked their whole companies, their whole careers on this language. That's a lot of momentum to suddenly move in this other direction and to take that ecosystem, to take that language and expect it to shift into this new thing, Scala 3. Um, when, I, you know, when I first heard about this, it, it seemed almost impossible uh, to, to imagine that this would ever happen. Uh, and I, you know, I thought about the code bases that I knew, you know, these, these multi-million line behemoths that you know, had very deep dependencies on, on you know, intricate and complex elements of the Scala ecosystem like Shapeless. And I just couldn't come up with a way that, that these, you know, these code bases could ever be expected to migrate. I, I expected, well, they're just going to be on Scala 2 forever, and we're just going to have to hope that the momentum will carry us. Um, and, you know, I'm sitting here today, and I am happy to report that I was wrong. I was wrong. I really believe that this migration to Scala 3 is going to work. And the reason I believe it's going to work is because of the massive amount of attention and focus and effort that has been placed and vested in making the migration effort a success. The amount of tooling that has been created in the form of, you know, ScalaFix migration rules and, you know, a, an entire re-implementation of the Scala 2 unpickler so that Scala 3 can, you know, be pointed at Scala 2 compiled artifacts and jars and, and actually read them and, and use those dependencies that the way that we would have been used within Scala 2. Uh, the tasty reader within Scala 2 and 3 um, to try to you know, make it a little bit easier to, to work bi-directionally between Scala 2 and Scala 3. But most importantly of all, the laser focus on source compatibility between Scala 3 and Scala 2, that is truly a remarkable and Herculean effort. Um, I, I salute with from the bottom of my heart uh, the, the authors of the Scala 3 compiler and, and the, you know, the attention to detail and the focus that's been given to this. Um, I particularly want to call out Guillaume. Um, you, you may know him as Smarter on, on Gitter and, and you know, various you know, GitHub and, and, and various other sources. Um, you know, his incredible work and his incredible efforts and attention and, and time and care spent with many members of the Scala community, including myself, to try to identify issues as early as possible, to try to narrow down bugs, often bugs that were my own doing in my own code, and, and you know, figure out whether or not it was something that the Scala 3 compiler could do better at. That is just it, it, the amount of attention and labor that went into that has paid dividends. Because now I can sit before you now and say that in many ecosystems in the Scala, you know, the Scala community today, if your application is written against many of these ecosystems, you can just change the Scala version in your build.sbt and fix some minor compilation errors that are, are probably very straightforward to address. And then you're just, your application is running on Scala 3 almost from day one. And that seemed actually impossible to me just five years ago. And, and the work that has gone into this system between then and now is truly astonishing. So from the bottom of my heart, I, I really thank everyone who has worked so hard to make this a success. I really believe that this is you know something that's going to be great. And this is really a watershed moment in the Scala ecosystem and the Scala community um, and, and our history as a community. I really believe that this foundation that has been built is, is going to stand the test of time. And, uh, you know, we're going to be here for a very, very long time, building on the work, building on the efforts 
of, of what has transpired today and what has been transpiring over the last more than half a decade at this point. So for that and many, many more reasons, I am very, very excited about this. And, and I look forward uh, to carrying things forward uh, into the new era and, and, and leveraging and adopting uh, all of the great new things that Scala 3 brings to us uh, that, that we couldn't have experienced in this way on Scala 2. So uh, my question for Martin is, is simply this. In any platform effort, uh, in any uh, sort of system like Scala, which is a language or, you know, a large API, um, you as the designer of that platform, you must spend a lot of time thinking about how people are going to use the features and the fundamentals that you are designing and building in the language. So my question for you is, is not what features of Scala 3 are you most excited about personally? Um, not, and my question is not, what are the features of Scala 3 that uh, you know, I am most excited about, but rather, what are the features of Scala 3 that you are most excited to see the community adopt? What are the things that you expect will give rise to a whole new class of expressiveness and safety and, and comprehensibility that never could have happened on Scala 2? So that is my question to you, Martin. Like identify what, what are the features that, that you believe will benefit the ecosystem most and you're most excited to see us adopt. Thank you so much for this monumental effort.